coming up on Colonial Crossfire. A 2016 campaign update. Supreme Court cases on the docket. And should Britain leave the EU? Joining us on the left, Tremaine Smith. On the right, Brandon Whitehill. And I'm your moderator, Andrew Desiderio. This is Colonial Crossfire. It would seem that we finally have our two nominees, but one candidate just made an unusual move designed to regain the campaign spotlight. Welcome to Colonial Crossfire. I'm Andrew Desiderio. Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are sailing to their respective parties' nominations, and barring any unprecedented comebacks or a contested convention on the GOP side, it looks like those two will meet on that general election debate stage. So what, if anything, can the Republican establish establishment do to stop Trump this late in the game? And will Bernie Sanders continue to drag out his challenge to Hillary Clinton? Here to analyze that and more, our familiar student panel. On the left, Tremaine Smith, a graduate student from Salisbury, North Carolina, in the School of Political Management. Tremaine is the special assistant to Congressman G.K. Butterfield and a student senator in the GW Student Association. On the right, Brandon Whitehill, a sophomore from Philadelphia, majoring in international affairs and economics. Brandon is the co-president of the GW Young Americas Foundation. Thanks to both of you for joining us, and good to have you both back. Donald Trump swept the five northeastern states that voted last week, winning more than 50 percent of the Republican tally in each and more than 60 percent in three of them. After that sweep, the billionaire businessman only needs to win 48 percent of the remaining delegates to reach the 1,237 required to secure the GOP nomination. In the Democratic race, Hillary Clinton won four of those five states that voted on April 26th, padding a seemingly insurmountable lead over Bernie Sanders. The Vermont senator decided to lay off more than 200 campaign employees the day after his week showing, citing simply the fact that there aren't that many primary contests left. Now, despite all of this, Sanders was still very upbeat on Tuesday night, making the case to his fellow Democrats that he is the best positioned candidate to take on the Republican nominee. And the reason that we are doing so much better Republican candidates is that not only are we winning the overwhelming majority of Democratic votes, but we are winning independent votes and some Republican votes as well. But Clinton still leads Sanders by more than 800 delegates, and his path to the nomination is becoming less clear with each passing week. So, Tremaine, is it time for Senator Sanders to throw in the towel? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me back again, and I'm looking forward to being here with Brandon. To answer your question, yes, throw in the towel. Quite frankly, I don't think he should even be in the game, but since he is, yes, throw in the towel. Uh, at some point, it becomes a matter of either prolonging the life of your campaign or prolong prolonging its death, and he's prolonging the inevitable demise of his campaign. It's time to get out, get behind Hillary, and let's be a strong, united front at our convention in July, and let's really keep the White House in November. Brandon, from a Republican perspective, what do you think Bernie Sanders wants out of all of this? When he got in the race, I think it's very clear he didn't think he would get this far. I mean, everything that he's won, this whole movement that he's, he's inspired has been a surprise to him, I, I really believe. And I think he wants to capitalize on that. And I think maybe he has hit a peak, his rally sizes, his wins, his, his margins, because Clinton is so close to that nomination. And so it would be unfortunate for him to fade into impotence rather than to leave on a high note. I think it is time to throw in the towel. Donald Trump's picking up the rhetoric that he should, he should run third party. I don't think he'll do that, but also it's interesting to note that he says it's Secretary Clinton's job to get his backers, which suggests maybe he won't endorse her or maybe not campaign actively for her, so we'll have to see. And that was my next question for you, Tremaine. Are you worried that Senator Sanders just won't endorse her, or even worse, would put conditions on a potential endorsement? Well, I think he'll endorse her because he doesn't want a Republican to win the White House. Uh, but I think Brandon has some valid points. I think he's going to probably put some conditions on it. I mean, he's been alluding to that uh, in the last few days as far as saying, we're gonna go to the convention with enough delegates in order to sort of make our points known and to have those infused into the party's platform that they'll approve. So yeah, I think he, he's, he's wanting something. 
Don't you think Senator Sanders is sort of using the same tactic, though, that, though, that Hillary Clinton did in 2008 when she ran against Barack Obama? She really prolonged the race, dragged it out until the very end. Isn't Sen uh, Senator Sanders using that same exact tactic? I think so, but, you know, at this point, the inevitability is so much more stark. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's time for him to get out. But again, politics is a game. He's, he's wanting to milk it for all it's worth. He's got a lot of support. He's got a lot of ideas. And I don't think he ran a campaign this long and this fervently to just, you know, have it go by the wayside. I think he wants to get something from it. Brandon, speaking of dragged out races, what do you make of this apparent truce between Governor Kasich and Senator Cruz to try and stop Donald Trump from securing the necessary delegates to get the GOP nomination? And is it a sign of desperation? I don't even think it exists anymore. This is something they put out. It was, it was, it was just, I mean, they had to put out there because their super PACs were actively fighting against each other in Indiana, for instance, where Cruz may have a chance of, of defeating uh, Donald Trump. So they can't obviously collude with their super PACs. So they kind of put out this, this statement, this is what we're doing, everyone act accordingly. So I think it may be effective in that sense. And if Cruz can beat Donald Trump in Indiana, perhaps it's all worth it. But this is not some kind of grand truce. It's not going to work. And it really has faded away from the news cycle mm -hmm. in the course of two, three days. Jermaine, I'll give you the same question. Uh, this is so unusual. This whole thing is just so <laughs> unusual. Quite frankly, I'm enjoying it. Uh, I, I, I don't even know what to say. I, I just, I will defer to my Republican friend. <laughs> I, th I think he's best suited to answer that. I, I frankly am just enjoying it as a Democrat. All right, another, <laughs> another question for you as a Democrat then. So we saw this very unusual move, another unusual move in this campaign, when Senator Cruz picked Carly Fiorina to be his <laughs> vice president. Yeah. It's unusual because he hasn't received the GOP nomination yet, and he's not even in first place. So what do you think the rationale behind this move was? Well, frankly, I think it's made from a point of weakness. And I mean, it, I, I can't understand it, because here's their 22nd ad. Hi, I'm Carly Fiorina. I will get fired from a company after firing 10,000 people, lose the United States Senate race, run for president only to drop out disappointing tens of people, and then accept the VP nod whose merger will be just as successful as my last. Way to fail up the fee arena way. Yeah, you know, when you put those, th th those numbers together, it just doesn't make any sense. So it was made from a position of weakness. I think he thought maybe she can help out with uh, the woman, the women's problem that Trump obviously has, maybe help out in California. She didn't help herself much in California, but maybe she can help Cruz in California. Um, and so I think it was made at, at, out of desperation and, you know, he's not going to be president, she's not going to be vice president. Brandon, do you agree with Tremaine that this was made out of weakness? Well, first let me say, if, if I can wish upon you the success that Carly Fiorina has had, I think you'd be very well off because <laughs> she is a successful individual. That being said, uh, I think that Fiorina is a good face against Hillary Clinton. Uh, she has some memorable moments that she, she actually put Donald Trump in a, in a lower position that are memorable that not many other people have been able to do. Uh, and I think, you know, in, in a position of weakness, yeah, he lost five states, then picked a vice presidential yeah. candidate the next day. It was bizarre. But, you know, he's reinvigorated his campaign. He got a very long speech aired on national television. Uh, so I think it is uh, rallying the base that's not Donald Trump. So maybe attracting some Kasich voters, seeing all right, here's what the ticket will look like. Maybe I can get behind this. And again, if that helps them in Indiana, helps them in California maybe, mm. would be worth it. Do you think Kasich's presence in this race has kind of hurt Senator Cruz's case to make against Donald Trump as the sort of only alternative that the establishment can rally around? I don't think so, because Kasich is more establishment than, than Cruz, because if Cruz has become establishment, or Trump has become establishment, then there is no establishment. <laughs> that, that term is completely meaningless. So I think Kasich has done a good job of hedging against Trump in some respects, Cruz wasn't going to win Ohio. And I know Kasich is now, what, one for 42 Kasich? Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's not it's been a great abysmal. campaign. But he also picked up three delegates in, in one of the northeastern states. He's been doing better than Cruz would be able to do in those states. So I think mathematically his presence has helped the never Trump cause. Speaking of the math, uh, Donald Trump often bemoans sort of the what he calls the crooked delegate allocation system mm. in the Republican primary. Uh, but for example, in Pennsylvania, we saw that he won 57 percent of the vote, but got 100 percent of the delegates. So isn't the system crooked, but in his favor? I wouldn't call the system crooked. I don't think that's a proper premise. Just like we see this in the Democratic race with Senator Sanders. You know, are these results that we're seeing making a lot of sense to us in a democratic society? Maybe not. But the rules have been clear for everyone from the beginning. You know, when you sign on to be right. a party's candidate, you sign on to that party's rules and that party's platform and everything like that. 
So I don't think anyone should be surprised. The results might surprise us as we see these allocations, but you can't call it a crooked system when it's been clear from the beginning what that system's going to do. Absolutely. Tremaine, do you agree? Yeah, I agree. Listen, you, you sign up to play for a team, you, you decide to play by their rules. And it's he, Trump calls foul when it doesn't go in his favor. And he, he you know, yells triumph when it does. And so, uh, again, it's convoluted, if not confusing. I agree. But when you decide to play for the team, you decide to play by the rules. And be that in your favor or not, you've got to abide by them. And finally, this question's for both of you. Can you envision any scenario in which Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton do not receive their respective parties' nominations? Tremaine, I'll start with you. No. All right, short but sweet. Brennan? All right, I will say this. I think everyone agrees that if Donald Trump doesn't get the 1237 on the first ballot, he will not be the nominee, because no one's going to then go in his favor after that when the delegates are freed to vote. So I think we'll have to see how Indiana goes. That's really a pivotal point for Cruz's campaign, and we'll have to see how California goes. If Trump does strongly in those states, he'll be the nominee. I think we're getting closer to that inevitable yeah. conclusion. But there is a small scenario I can see Trump not being the Republican nominee. And I guess we're all looking forward to those debates then. Oh, huh? it's going to be pay-per-view. Pay pay it's it's going to be fun, right? <laughs> I'm already getting my popcorn together. <laughs> and coming up after the break, we'll turn our discussion to judicial efforts to address some of the most pressing domestic issues, including immigration reform and voter ID laws. Stay with us. Raise high. This isn't just our battle cry. It's our call, our challenge. Because when you were called to Washington, you were called to higher expectations, to a higher standard. We are called here to advance knowledge, to serve society, to change the world. This is the George Washington University, and what we make is history. So stand up, be bold, take risks, press on, push harder, raise high. Welcome back. The Supreme Court recently held oral arguments in United States v. Texas, a case that will ultimately determine whether President Obama's 2014 executive actions on immigration reform are legal. Texas is leading the charge, backed by 25 other states, arguing that the Obama administration did not have the legal backing to unilaterally protect 4 million undocumented immigrants from deportation. Back when he first announced the plan, DAPA, or Deferred Action for Parents of Americans, House Republicans were refusing to consider the so-called Gang of Eight Immigration Reform Bill passed by the Senate. So, President Obama decided to go it alone. Now, I continue to believe that the best way to solve this problem is by working together to pass that kind of common sense law. But until that happens, there are actions I have the legal authority to take as president, the same kinds of actions taken by Democratic and Republican presidents before me, that will help make our immigration system more fair, and more just. With immigration reform a hot topic on the 2016 campaign trail, the Supreme Court's ruling on this specific case will have far-reaching implications. Brandon, doesn't the president have the right to do this, given that Congress didn't act on what was considered a bipartisan issue? Well, Congress's failure to act can be looked at a, a complete vacuum of authority, or it can look like the denial of authority. In both cases, the president cannot just then unilaterally decide, well, you know, they didn't pass it, didn't come to my desk, but I'll do it anyway. And he said no fewer than 22 times before he then announced that he was expanding DACA and doing this DAPA program that he did not have the legal authority to do this by his own executive pen. Mm. Tremaine, do you think that the president should skirt Congress on issues like this one that directly affect so many people? Well, when it affects so many people, I can't imagine why Congress doesn't want to act. Now, the Senate kind of did its job. What baffles me that congressional Republicans in their uh, continued obstructionism of this president refused to act. And I completely agreed with and support the president when at um, one of his State of the Union addresses, he said he's going to fight obstruction with action. I'm glad he's taken action. He has the ability and the authority to do so, and I'm glad he's acting. Well, at least someone is. Should these undocumented workers be allowed to work in the U.S.? You know, I think that that's at the heart of the issue here. I think that uh, we should really take a look at it, but I think, yeah. Absolutely. Brandon, do you think they should at least get some type of work permit to be able to contribute? Well, I think on the merits of the case, uh, that's not even the merits of the case, mm -hmm. on the, the substance of the issue, sure. I mean, we can, we can talk about immigration policy, and you're right, that has election implications, but on the merits of the case, right. the question is, does, Obama, does President Obama have the legal authority to do this? Maybe. But yes. this also then comes with other benefits. Now, he, he, what this is, this program puts lower priority on deportation or the prosecution of those who are here illegally. So they're still unlawfully here, 
What this program then also does is affords other benefits to be able to legally work here. So this came up in oral arguments. Justice Alito said, how can you be unlawfully here but legally able to work? It really just doesn't make sense. And what Texas suggests is its injury in this case and why it's suing the United States is because the benefits that are afforded by that lower designation injure it on a financial basis. That's it standing in court. Sure. I don't believe President Obama has the ability to impose on all the states these financial burdens, afford these extra congressional benefits that the Constitution says, not only that the legislative power shall be vested in a Congress, but that the Congress shall have powers of naturalization and rules of citizenship. Mm -hmm. Well, Congress is refusing to do their job in addressing and confronting these issues, and I think... But does uh, that then just take that portion of the Constitution and just throw it over to well, the president's and authority? and the issue at heart here is whether or not the case is justiciable or not. The Obama That's administration true. is saying it's not justiciable. Of course, yeah. And what it would do, it would wreck a 50 years precedent of um, a secretary being able to offer um, you know, so, so reprieve to undocumented workers or to offer them some sort of um, deferred action to these illegal Well, the residents. reprieve comes in the form of the lower status to be deported. You know, if you're a parent of a child, we're not going to break you up. We're not going to depu you deport you first. Right. You deport the criminals first and, and things like that. Unless you're Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, but uh, what, what this program has also done, as I said, is afford other benefits too that require the state to expend resources on you mm -hmm. when you are here unlawfully. Right, right. And that is the injury that Texas and these 24 other states, 25 other states have said is their standing. Right. Now, what do I think the outcome of this case will be? Yeah. I think the only majority consensus that can be built on this case is dismissing the case on lack of standing. Mm -hmm. But but there, there, Congress there, there needs to do its job case. and address this these issues. This isn't about Congress well, not well, doing its job. It's about, can well, you that, have an imperial president well, that necessitated who just says, that necessitated the executive action. That's the but reason we still we're have here. a separation of powers. Sure, and that's to be respected. So where's the, where's the limit? Could, I, could President Obama say we're not going to deport anyone? That would probably have his day in court as well if he did. It would, and, and Solicitor General Varelli said he would not have the authority to do that. Right. So I can kind of answer that for you. And it's also worth mentioning that in this particular case, the Supreme Court added on its own volition, no one said that this was something that they wanted to, to figure out, but the Supreme Court added a question, did President Obama violate the Section 2, Clause 3, take care provision of the Constitution, mm -hmm. that, the law, that the President should take care that the laws be faithfully executed? Mm -hmm. Because being here illegally is a crime. It, it, it and if you're not is. going to deport people, you can designate statuses, right. you can have your secretary direct certain things, but if you don't enforce laws that are on the book. And I think you should. If you don't enforce laws on the book, you're in a constitutional violation. Mm -hmm. So the Supreme Court, if they do go past standing and decide the merits of the case, will answer that question when no one else asked them to do it. Mm -hmm. So well, I don't think it'll be justiciable. All right, and you guys won't agree on this next e issue either, <laughs> probably, but let's see, let's, let's try it. A judge in North Carolina ruled in favor of the state's strict new voter ID law. Opponents say this law and similar ones unfairly target minority voters, while supporters contend that it's a valuable tool to protect against voter fraud. Tremaine, this is your home state. Aren't voter ID laws necessary to combat voter fraud? They are, but this is just another example of Republicans in our state having a solution in search of a problem. We want to curtail voter fraud. Give me an example of widespread voter fraud. Why are you loosening gun laws but strengthening uh, voting rights? It just makes no sense, and it is a meticulous and malicious target of the, of the resources that folks who are minorities and older who typically vote Democratic in our state, these are their mechanisms that they use. Early voting, pre-registration if you're 16 years old, souls to the polls, you know, Sunday voting. They, 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 they're doing away with that. And so I think it, it's, a, it's an unnecessary hurdle, these voter ID laws, it's an unnecessary burden, and it's contrary to a democracy. Brandon, do you think that uh, voter fraud is a bigger issue than the potential consequences that Tremaine is speaking of, of this type of law? I think if you can take reasonable means towards a reasonable end, you're fine in terms of a democratic society. Right, There's right. an existential issue about how we're treating our voters. Uh, voter citizens. fraud is real. We have dead people who are voting. We have people who are voting twice in the same name, and it, it's an issue. I mean, maybe not widespread. Two percent. Maybe not. Maybe not you know, the, the turning point of elections, but why should we tolerate that in our society? If we really believe in the principle of one person, one vote, why are we letting non-persons vote? Sure, but in, why in, are we making it harder set? Now that being said, that is the reasonable end. The reasonable means, I find this line of reasoning really, really interesting, mm -hmm. that it's targeted minorities yes. and everything like that, because this, this judge, this district judge who, who issued this case wrote a 485 opinion, mm -hmm. page opinion, uh, that upheld every single aspect of the voter ID legislation. And it, part of his fact finding and the basis for his, his upholding of that is that voter turnout increased, including in minority communities. Mm. 
So how, if Republicans are trying to cut across the Democratic base and, and erode their ability and their access to the polls, they're doing a pretty bad job of it. Well, they're doing a bad job of it at a lot, but what they're doing is they're making it harder for citizens to vote. You know, I don't see how that's uh, well, even a possible claim well, to mount when more voters turn out after these laws are passed. When you have voter ID laws that make it harder for senior citizens to make get it harder access how? to how? Uh, the appropriate, uh, appropriate uh, identification for voting, when college students can no longer, uh, in some instances, vote where they go to college, you have to go home, where you eliminate same day registration to vote. These are things that typically, these are measures that are typically utilized by people of color in my state. And so when Republicans sit down and don't address education, don't address the poverty in the state, don't address the budget and say, well, we want to stop this voter fraud. Well, I'm it, not, it's absolutely ridiculous. I'm not going to wade into internal North Carolina sure. politics well, being since your I've, home well, state. It's, well, and since I live there and I'm affected by it and yes. I, my neighbors are affected by it, I think instead of the Republicans in our state changing uh, the, the laws to make it harder for people to vote, I think they should change their policies to better reflect the changing mood of the state and the nation and make it easier for people to vote. And I, I agree with you, things should be easy to vote. But your arguments may be valid on the front end in a debate over whether or not we should have this legislation. Mm. But on and the back shouldn't. end, once it was passed, your arguments are entirely null that more people have come out, including minority communities. And this is this is the trend of voter rights, voting rights in the United States. So the 2013 case, uh, Shelby County v. Holder, mm -hmm. that made this voter ID legislation possible in right, North Carolina. Right. And the Supreme Court said we're not going to have these 1965-esque restrictions because we don't have those same problems anymore. <laughs> and even after these as legi Lake, this as legislation, they did then, they still and exist. even after this legislation, minority communities came out to vote in greater numbers. So I see this as a win-win. Well, well, we're not going to reasonable you know, end, reasonable means to a reasonable. Well, minority end. voters aren't going to stop because then they would win. You know, but I'm just it, waiting for the they, I'm just waiting for the poll tax and the literacy test to come back. And it's a straw man argument. Yeah. All right, I guess the only common ground here is that voter fraud is bad, right? It's Can we bad. Agree on that? Okay, good. All right, moving on. President Obama's Supreme Court nominee Merrick Garland has met with 10 Republican senators to date, but is still no closer to being confirmed or even receiving a hearing. Brandon, do you think this is still a tenable position for the Senate GOP? Yeah, I don't think it's adversely affected them in any way, shape, or means. I mean, Merrick Garland looks farther than ever from being a Supreme Court justice, and the pressure on Senate Republicans is lighter than it's ever been. Tremaine, if a Democrat is elected president in November, do you envision a scenario whereby Republicans would try to, uh, you know, fast track, I guess, Garland's nomination in anticipation of a more liberal nominee from a President Hillary Clinton or a President Bernie Sanders? Well, I don't know if they'd fast track it. I, I can't make heads or tails of why they're not giving this man, this very qualified man, a, a fair hearing, a confirmation hearing. Um, they pine for him. Orrin Hatch pine. Why can't you? When he when he nominated, I, I don't know if it was Sotomayor or Kagan. Why can't you choose someone like Garland? He would be he would be great. Why now? Why now? And so I think it's just another bit of Republican obstructionism to deny this president anything. As Mitch McConnell, that was his first his first objective was to deny this president anything. And so this is just another um, another example of that. There's no reason that they cannot give him a hearing. This is this is unlike anything we've ever seen, but it's not surprising. Brandon? Let's, let's talk about democratic judicial obstructionism for a second, shall we? Look at the four reliably liberal justices on the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. They were all their appointers, first choice, and they all received more than 60 votes in the United States Senate. Now look at the conservative ones. Justice Kennedy was President Reagan's third choice because Democrats obstructed Robert Bork's nomination and completely assassinated his character on yeah. national television for the whole world to and see. And now Bork is a, <laughs> yeah. And now Bork is dead, yeah, like Antonin Scalia. Mm. Uh, so we have Kennedy as the third choice. You have Clarence Thomas, who was also drugged through the mud on what he called yeah, a high-tech lynching right, yeah. and received 52 votes in the United States Senate, the most razor-thin margin but in history. But did get hearings. Yes, they got okay. hearings. That's, that's what I'm arguing. They should give them a hearing. What I'm saying is that this whole concept, th there is a concept in the history of the United States to give deference to the president's pick for judges. Republicans have held that up to the year 2016. Mm -hmm. They have given deference and respect to the president's judicial nomination. They should at least give them a hearing is what I'm saying. But Democrats have disrespected that for the last 50 years and is finally catching but up to But did those to, folks uh, you, you, you mentioned give, get hearings? Because Article 2, but Section 2 of the so Constitution. Why are you hung up on hearings? Well, because I mean, of the Senate, happening. Theoretically, the Senate could vote to confirm Garland without any hearings. The sure. hearings are almost inconsequential. Well, it's consequential because it, it continues to reinforce this narrative, and it's a true one that the Republicans just want to obstruct uh, in this it's president. It's not about the per. It's about the principle that we are in election year in the middle of a Supreme Court term that's the about to decide The Constitution says nothing about an election year. It says that Article 2, Section 2 of the and president the has the power says to nominate in the Senate 
advisor consent. And we have never seen an instance like this. With now, listen, if this were the Republicans only shot at saying, "Well, we're not going to we're not going to do this," then okay, we'll see. But they've done it since January twentieth. 2009, when he well, rose, no, when, because, he, wait, when wait, he raised wait, his hand he's and already took had, the oath of office. He's already had two uh, ju uh, he has. Supreme so, Court justices so I'm, I'm who got nominations, so who I'm got wondering why hearings, not now? and got more than 60 votes in the they Senate. They did, so that why not like now? That sounds like a pretty respectful process. Sure, so let's continue that respectful process. Guys, if I could intervene here for a sec. Brandon, President Obama was re-elected in 2012 to another four-year term. Isn't that his mandate alone to, I guess, fulfill his the constitutional obligation? The President shall uh, nominate a Supreme Court justice. The Senate may, it does not say shall in the Constitution, provide hearings given the conditions of our country, this vitriolic election season, the very consequential cases that are the Supreme Court's in the middle of a term to decide. The fact that you have the most conservative justice of the Supreme Court and longest serving on the court die unexpectedly. These are all conditions that one reasonable person mm -hmm. may say, and especially because, by the way, President Obama has such skin in the game in a lot of these cases. Yeah. It's his policies that are about to be decided. It's reasonable to say that the people should just get a chance to, to put in their voice. They did when they reelected him twice. And they did and they when did they gave. When the GOP now 43% say that he should at least get a hearing, and 61% of Americans say they should And did the people not a give a voice to the United States Senate, voting them overwhelmingly Republican in the 2014 midterm elections? But, and the but Senate saying that has the just as much say in who sits on that they court do. as they the president. They do. They do. But they say they're saying that you know the people should have a vote, a voice related to the president. They're not talking about the Senate. And they had a voice when they reelected him twice. Well, the, the Constitution gives deference to both branches co-equally. Mm. The people gave Republicans voice in one. Yeah. The people gave Democrat, uh, Democrat Obama yeah. the, cho the choice in the other. He chose his person, and, so now they're and choosing the Senate to do is nothing. choosing their course of action. Not All right, and that, nothing. that will be the last word on that, guys. We do have to move on. Thank you so much. After this break, it's rapid fire. Stay with us. Welcome back. Our panel joins us again for a rapid fire. Some quick answers to some quick questions. A controversial law in North Carolina requires transgender people to only use the bathrooms of their biological sex, not the gender they identify with. Tremaine, are these provisions necessary? No, they're unnecessary. Again, it's a solution in search of a problem by our Republicans in the state who want to make the state red, R-E-D. Restrict, exclude, and deny. There's been no widespread safety concerns for, with transgender individuals being in the restrooms, and it's just a, a wedge issue to drum up the base in an election year. Brandon, is this just, as Tremaine says, a solution in search of a problem that the evidence says doesn't really have any backing? Well, that was, that was clever, by the way. That was, that was nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that being said, in a, in a, this law is facially neutral. It does not say transgenders, you must use this bathroom or that bathroom. It says you must use the bathroom that corresponds with your birth gender. That's really crazy. That's it's crazy. facially neutral, which means you know it doesn't target one group or the other, and towards a reasonable end. You, you want to avoid sexual harassment or the potential sexual violence in a bathroom. Okay. You want to be comfortable when you go to the bathroom. So in a, in a democratic and a free society, this is a perfectly legitimate manifestation of majority rule. Right, but it's costing our state a lot of money. It's costing our state uh, it's uh, negligible. You know, a lot of It's uh, so it's negligible. Insurance. But it's, it's happening, and it's going to be challenged in court. Well, it's being challenged by the ACLU. Yeah, it's just sure. unnecessary. All right, and that's why we call it rapid fire. The UK is considering leaving the European Union, an action that would have serious implications on that country's trade deals and diplomatic relations. President Obama weighed in on the discussion in a recent visit to London, saying Britain would have much less influence globally. Brandon, do you think this would be a good idea? Well, I read an interesting op-ed a couple weeks ago, and it, posed, it framed the issue in this way. If this were Britain voting to join the EU for the first time, would they vote yes or no? I think not. Uh, yeah, I agree. Tremaine, do you think that the president uh, kind of waded into an issue that he doesn't really have any ground to do so, given that, as many are saying, this is strictly a domestic political issue within the UK? It is a domestic political issue in the UK, but it has international consequences. I personally think that they should stay in the EU, and they should not Brexit. All right. And the Treasury Department recently announced that Harriet Tubman will replace Andrew Jackson on the front of the $20 bill, and Alexander Hamilton will remain the face of the $10 bill, among many other changes. 
Brandon, some Republicans took issue with the decision to demote Andrew Jackson. How do you see it? Some Democrats took issue with that too, actually, but I think Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill is a wonderful thing. I think it's fantastic. She was an African-American, Republican, gun-toting uh, person who's going to be great on the $20 bill. I'm looking forward to using it. Yeah. Jermaine? Well, I'm looking forward to using it. I'm looking forward to having it. But I think that, um, yeah, I think it's a good idea. And a lot of the contention is, you know, this isn't the first time we've had a change in the countenance of currency. Mm -hmm. Sam Chase was the first man on the dollar bill, but this is the first time we've had a white man replaced by a black woman, a white slave owner replaced by a black former slave. So, there, uh, you know, there's, there's that. But I'm excited and I think it's a very good sign of where we're moving as a country. Progression. And Puerto Rico owes $422 million to its creditors by May 1st, a deadline it will likely miss. Some Republicans in the House, including Speaker Paul Ryan, are supporting a bill that would allow Puerto Rico to restructure its debt and authorize the creation of a financial control board. Tremaine, should Congress pass this legislation? I think they should. They should uh, provide Puerto, Ric Port Puerto Rico with the necessary reforms to manage this crisis. Brandon? I agree. I like what Speaker Ryan's doing. A debt restructuring, a debt forgiveness program is good. And it's important to note for my friends on the right, this is not a bailout. You know, right. we, we have a responsibility to Puerto Rico. We'll have spillover effects if it defaults. We should be doing this. Should it become a state? No. I don't know. <laughs> All right. And with that, we end our debate. And it, and it was a real one here on Colonial Crossfire. Thank you so much, Tremaine Smith and Brandon Whitehill, for joining us. When we come back, Casey Decker has our debate fact check. Don't miss it. Welcome back. During our panel discussion, a team of fact checkers monitored our debate. Casey Decker is here to fill us in on what we missed. Casey? Thanks, Andrew. First, let's take a look at Brandon, our conservative debater. He said that John Kasich won three delegates from the five northeastern states that held primaries on Tuesday. In fact, Kasich won five delegates from those states, as opposed to Ted Cruz's three and Donald Trump's 109. In our debate over voter ID laws, Brandon pointed out that turnout actually increased in North Carolina after its controversial law was passed. That's true, but it's worth noting that opponents of the law argue turnout only increased because of grassroots efforts to get out the vote, that those efforts were created as a direct response to the voter ID law. They argue that without these efforts and without a hotly contested Senate race in the most recent midterm election, turnout would have been visibly suppressed. And that's all we have for the fact check. Andrew? Thanks, Casey. And now for Spilled Milk. Here's our tribute to the very best of late night political comedy. in Flint, Michigan, and how the governor has been completely blowing the response. In fact, he's been screwing up so bad, Beyonce just released a concept album about what he did. John Kasich picking a running mate is like Vin Diesel practicing his Oscars acceptance speech. A royal handshake from Little Prince George up past his bedtime to meet the president. The toddler in a spa robe, matching pajamas and slippers, all of it shared on a young royal's Twitter feed. That robe, OMG, so sweet, one follower wrote, and the most adorable display of a power dynamic ever. Is it, though? Is it because I would say it's a little demeaning for the president to have to crouch down and greet a toddler dressed as Hugh Hefner. You know, the only thing she's got is the woman card. and That's all she's got. You know, it's a weak card in her hand. In another person's hands, it could be a very powerful card. Yeah, yeah. If you put that woman card in a man's hand, that would be very powerful. <laughs> also, it would keep you out of a bathroom in North Carolina. First of all, let's start by saying, leave Tom Brady alone. Leave him alone. Leave him alone. He's a great guy. I mean, getting cheers by saying, leave Tom Brady alone in New England is as easy as getting cheers for saying Donald Trump should not be president. <laughs> all right, well, that's all for this episode of Colonial Crossfire, the last for this school year and the end of season six. And we do want to say a very bittersweet goodbye to our graduating general manager, Alyssa Perrin. 
who has been the engine of this organization this year and our floor director extraordinaire over these last few years. For all the latest updates from our political team at any time, be sure to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. For all of us here at GWTV, I'm Andrew Desiderio. Thanks for getting caught in the crossfire with us. Have a great summer, GW. We'll see you right back here in the fall.